In the late 1970s, when Mike Hill was coming up as a picture editor through the ranks for Paramount Studio Projects in Los Angeles, Chick Ciccolini, Tom Fleischman, and Bob Chafalis were working steadily as sound editor and re-recording mixers, respectively, in New York studios. They all came together working on the films of Ron Howard. Originally from Oklahoma and popularly recognized for his early work as an actor in the television series The Andy Griffith Show and Happy Days, Ron Howard worked his way up into becoming a successful filmmaker beginning in the late 1970s. Since then, his films such as Splash, Apollo 13, A Beautiful Mind, Cinderella Man, and more recently Solo, A Star Wars Story, have been recognized with some of the world's most prestigious awards. Adaptive to almost any genre, he has never shied away from traveling into new narrative territory. I mean, what he really is is a storyteller, you know, and he loves all different kinds of stories. I think that's what accounts for why he'd made so many diverse types of films. He was always really excited about each project. Uh, he's exactly how you would expect Opie or Richie Cunningham to be. I'm your host, Isabel Sederni, and in this episode of Frame by Frame, you'll meet the collaborators of Ron Howard, including picture editor Mike Hill, supervising sound editor Chick Ciccolini, and re-recording mixers Bob Chafalis and Tom Fleischman, talking about their work on such films as Night Shift, Gung Ho, Far and Away, A Beautiful Mind, and Cinderella Man. Frame by Frame is presented by Post New York Alliance because it's how you finish the counts. You can share this conversation through our website, bit.do slash frame by frame, or via Twitter at at postny. Write us with suggestions for upcoming episodes or comments at frame by frame at postnewyork.org. Picture editor Mike Hill and supervising sound editor Chick Ciccolini joined us via voice over IP. This session was recorded at Soundtrack New York. Mike Hill started things off by talking about meeting Dan Hanley for the first time as an apprentice editor on the Paramount lot and the wild course of events that led both of them to working as editors with Ron Howard for the next 30 years. I had started in 1973 as an apprentice editor at Paramount Studios and spent about seven or eight years there. I had no film school at all. I got into it strictly by luck. 1973 was a very good year to get into the union. It was a very busy time and everybody was working and somehow I got in there. So Dan Hanley was also at Paramount as an apprentice. Dan was actually the one who knew Ron first because he was working on Laverne and Shirley, which was the same production company as Happy Days. And Dan's editor at that time was a guy named Bob Kern. And he became Ron's editor when Ron directed some TV movies in the late 70s. You know, when Ron started directing, he did three TV movies and Bob Kern and Dan worked on those. So when Night Shift came along in 1982, they needed some more bodies. So Dan asked me if I was interested in working on this Ron Howard movie. Needless to say, I jumped at that. Mike Hill has collaborated with editor Dan Hanley on each of Ron Howard's films since he began over 30 years ago editing Night Shift. It was their collaboration on Apollo 13 which earned them both an Oscar for Best Editing. Mike was also awarded a BAFTA for Rush in 2013. He was subsequently nominated by the Academy for Best Editing for a Dramatic Motion Picture for A Beautiful Mind, Cinderella Man, and Frost Nixon. I asked Mike to talk about how their first project, Night Shift, came together. Their first project together was Night Shift. It was Brian's story idea based on an actual news article he read. So he brought it to Ron, and that's how it all got started. We started out as being assistant editors to Bob Kern, who was, you know, in his 50s. And uh, we just figured to be assistants and we would cut scenes because it was a very tight schedule. But Bob had a stroke. The editor had a stroke about a week before shooting started. And Ron gave us, he, he let us be the editors. And, you know, it was kind of shocking that the studio didn't, wasn't on board with that, but he talked him into it. And he didn't even know me that well. He knew Dan pretty well. So that was our break. And then um, Night Shift turned out to be fairly successful, and he stuck with us for the next 30 years. <laughs> we developed a shorthand where it didn't take a whole lot of talk to understand each other. And Ron was great because he gave us a lot of freedom to do our own thing, and he didn't sit over our shoulders very much at all. And I think that was really helpful to us to learn what we were doing and discover our own way of doing things and making our own mistakes. And, you know, we were young and kind of green and it was great to have a guy like that leading us. It was just one of those things where after a while we had a routine where we just, you know, he'd be shooting a film and he'd look at some scenes that we had cut on, on a weekend maybe, but he wouldn't really say too much. 
and we assembled the entire film. By the time he was done shooting, we had an assembly, and we'd show him the whole thing about a week or two later, and then we'd start in getting serious about his notes. He'd give us notes on each scene, and, and we would do them and then show him again, and it was just a process of uh, continuous whittling and honing until we finally found what we wanted. So we just had a, a two-editor system that really worked out well. You guys were a great team, without a doubt. What's nice about it is that, as an editor, you've got another editor that you can go to if you're having a problem with a scene. If I'm having a problem, I could go to Dan and show it to him, and he'll have a fresh eye, and he might have a whole different perspective on something that is bothering me that I didn't think I could solve. And he says, oh, yeah, it's, just do this. And so that's nice to have as a backup, somebody who's got your back. So that's pretty much how it went. You know, we did so many different kinds of films comedies, dramas, westerns, action. You know, you just had to be able to do every type of film. You know, I don't think we could ever be pinned down as to having a particular style. Dan and I used to refer to him as using a velvet hammer because he never got angry, he never raised his voice, he never belittled anyone, and we didn't always agree. And he was very open to disagreement. But if there was something that he felt strongly about, he was going to use the velvet hammer. He was going to make sure that it got done. 90% of the time, we knew what he would like. But every once in a while, he'd fool us. And if we disagreed with him, then we'd have to go round and round a little. But he always got his way pretty much when he needed to. I think if he likes you, it, it helps a lot. Uh, he, just, he just likes you as a person. I could attest to that myself as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's supervising sound editor Chick Ciccolini, who's worked in the film industry for 43 years, working with Ron Howard over 28 years on 14 of his films. Additional credits include work with Alan J. Pakula on Sophie's Choice, David Mamet on House of Games and Things Change, Frank Oz on The Muppets Take Manhattan, Ryan Murphy on Eat, Pray, Love, and the HBO series Sex in the City and The Corner. Chick talked about the interview that launched a nearly 30-year working relationship with Ron Howard. In 1985, I got a phone call to interview with Dan and Mike and Ron, and I met them up in Coscob, Connecticut. Well, Coscob, you know, which is right next to Greenwich, we um, rented some condos. We lived in them and edited in them. We, had, we set up the living room as an editing room, and the garage was an editing room. And those are the old days when we were splicing film and we had these big editing benches and the movieolas and it was quite a, quite a scene. We were always basically on location for the entire shoot and post-production. He moved out to Connecticut. He decided to relocate to the East Coast. He didn't want his kids to grow up in the, uh, in the Hollywood scene at the time, is what yeah. he told me. Yeah, he relocated. So that's how we ended up in New York. So I went to this interview and sat down in a kind of a living room setup. And Dan and Mike made me feel very relaxed and comfortable. And Ron, too. It was, it was really kind of um, exciting because this would be my first time physically seeing Ron. And Ron has always been somebody special growing up because I watched him on television and watched him go from, you know, the Andy Griffith show to Happy Days and see him in different movies that he was in with uh, John Wayne. And we just started talking and they just, you know, started asking me questions about this, that, and the other thing. And in my nervousness, I found myself <laughs> rubbing my chest. <laughs> and, I, you know, they just kept looking. Okay, they didn't say anything, and here I am giving them a whole explanation of my background and what I do, and everything seemed cool. They said, thank you, and I moved on, and then I got a call about a week later saying that I got the job as supervising a sound editor on Gung Ho, and I was thrilled and surprised, and then I proceeded to ask the question as to what was the reason, and, and they basically said... They liked the guy who was in touch with himself. <laughs> so that did it for me. So Gung Ho was my first uh, experience. And of course, dealing with Paramount, which was, you know, a major studio. And we worked over at a company called Trans Audio at the time, later to be part of Todd A.O. And that's where I got to meet Bobby C., Bobby Shafalis, who at the time was an engineer putting together one of the nicest re-recording studios at the time, 
in New York. It was January, January yeah. of 1986 when we opened, that's, and Gung Ho was the first film that we mixed. That's in. right. Yeah. That's Bob Chafalis, who's worked with Ron Howard on multiple films, including Apollo 13 and Cinderella Man. Over a 40-year career in sound editing, he's also worked with directors such as Martin Scorsese, Spike Lee, and Jonathan Demme, among others. At the time, it probably was the biggest studio that New York has, has had. Uh, unfortunately, the building has been torn down, so the studio is, doesn't exist anymore. The studio was on the eighth floor, and the roof was above it, so they built a, a big cinder block addition on the roof, and then when they tore down the roof line that was enclosed in the cinder block, that's how they got you know, like a 26-foot or 30-foot ceiling in the room. So I, I spent two, two years building it, and then I was lucky enough to have them you know, as their first clients. And I was, I was 24 years old at the time, so I was a kid. I was involved in the technical side of, you know, building, maintaining, helping the studio work. So everything that they were doing and everything that the editors were doing and the mixing that was going on in the studio was totally new to me. Where did we mix Gung Ho, though? That was in a little... No, that was in that was in the big room with Dick Vorsek. Remember? The, studio C, the big room? We did some pre-dubbing in the little room, actually with Rick Dior. Because Rick was busy with other clients and what have you, they, they brought in... Mike Cerrone? Mike Cerrone, that's right. Yeah. And Mike sat in with Dick on the big console. The big console being a three-man... Um, it was a, a three-man quad eight console yeah. with a total of 48 inputs. The thing right. was 28 feet wide, but only 48 physical channels. <laughs> Today, it is hundreds. You can put hundreds of channels. Well, well each, each fader, you can have multiple, many, many inputs. Just press a button, and you know, now it's a dialogue, now it's a music, now it's they, an effect. And... They had to deliver the console on a truck, on a flatbed truck, and crane it through the side wall of the studio to get it in place. Where it was amazing. You? What street was that on? 54th Street between uh, Broadway and 8th. Yeah, right across the street from Studio 54. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was the first That was my first experience with these, guys. with these guys. But then I think we've done 10, 10 or 11 since then. And uh, I think when we started doing the paper, then uh, Rick Dior, who was a mixer that worked at Transaudio at the time, I started sitting with him at the console and helping him out and handling the project. So I worked with them on the paper. And then after that, I think was to Apollo. Apollo 13. Apollo 13. So uh, I know I spent a lot of time on the stage with uh, Ricky doing all the dialogue pre-mixing, getting all the, the squelches and the statics and all that right back and forth for the yep. communication and and talking about temp mixes. I don't, do you remember this, Chick, when we were... It's the scene with the uh, the Walkman floating in space, running out of battery oh, yes. power. And we, had, a, we, had, to come, we had to come up with that sound. And I remember... Uh, we were working with Ricky. We were doing the temp mixes, and I don't know if you came up with the idea or, or or Ricky that I would go into the back room and he would like call me on the phone to tell me when to shut the power off of the machine, so it would slow down and do this really slow crawl over the head and give you that sound effect of the roll. Right. And uh, we did it, and we got it on the first try. And we did it in the temp mix, and we could never recreate it. So that sound effect made it all the way through the final. Right and through that's to the final, Because exactly. we just couldn't do it again. But we did it. That's what they call temp mix magic, right? Yep, exactly. <laughs> to this day, probably Apollo 13 is probably the highlight of any of the films that I got to work on. It didn't seem like they can do anything wrong. Everything was working. No matter what sound, everything, it, it sounded so good. I just remember the launch. Remember that? How good that sounded in that oh, room? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Gave you chills. Yeah. I just remember every time that we worked together with the crew, it was like family. It was like a family reunion. You know, by the time you got to the fifth, sixth one, it was just so much fun working with these guys. And there was that day when the job was done and you had the next day and you'd come into the studio and there's nobody there. And you'd be like, oh, you know, it's depressing. And you couldn't wait for the next one. Um, but luckily, you know, we got to do quite a few together. The entire film was shot in Los Angeles at the Universal Studios on the sound stages. So we were editing there and, you know, the footage was just all green screen and they shot all of the, the controllers at NASA first. They shot all those things first. And so we didn't have any footage from the space capsule to even cut to. So we just had to slug it out with uh, with blank film. 
just to get a representation. The whole movie was like that. And it was just a, I remember thinking, uh, how are we ever going to get this thing done? I mean, how, how is this going to come together? It just looks like garbage. And Ron kept saying, don't worry about it. I'm happy with everything, so don't worry about it. And he would just guide us through it slowly. And eventually it all came together. I mean, the, you know, all of the stuff in this capsule and we were able to get everything cut together and figure out how to cross cut all those scenes. Then it really started to come together. And then by the time we got back to the East Coast with it, the mix just was really a, a great experience. And James Horner's music was fantastic, I thought. Yeah, it was beautiful. Yeah. It's rare that epic Western films are post-produced in New York sound studios. Far and Away, directed by Ron Howard, which hosted over 60 people within the post-production sound department alone, was an exception. Chick Ciccolini acted as supervising sound editor for that project, and Dominic Tavella, along with Lee Dichter, acted as the re-recording mixers. They shared their insights into how this epic romantic drama of Irish immigration came to life. Far and Away was a really big, epic movie that was brought to New York. These type of films don't usually get done in New York City. So this was a, a major challenge. The film was shot 65 millimeter. Everything was big. The sound crew was, was gigantic. We had dialogue effects. We had the music. We had ADR, Foley. Foley was done by Alicia and I think Brian Vancho. And Alicia Birnbaum really wanted to go all out with this because he too felt that this was an important movie for the New York scene. Shot in Montana and Ireland. Montana for all of the uh, land race and the boxing scenes. There was a lot of bare knuckle boxing and then came right to New York and started in on it. Do you remember, Chick, how Ron was not around that much? Oh, yeah. I know. yeah. We actually put a, a poster of Ron in the narration booth with a phone taped to his ear. Because <laughs> <laughs> he spent most of his time on the phone. He was busy. Yeah. We would send out a reel, which he would then screen at Universal, and then he would send us the notes. That was a, a movie that we wound up using two studios one for the dialogue and ADR, and the other was for sound effects, foleys, and backgrounds. And then together we moved everything into one studio where we put it all together. It was Dom who did the effects premixes, and Lee Dichter was the uh, dialogue, ADR, and music. This was interesting, too, because it was, um, it was five channel surround or six channel surround, but it was left, center, right, and stereo surrounds in 70 millimeter because Dolby Digital with five track and stereo surrounds was, was not quite there yet. It, it came out very shortly. This was 92, was it? Yeah. Yeah, because Dolby Digital came out shortly after that, but we were doing it in a conventional 70 millimeter mag format. That's re recording mixer Dominic Tavella, who's been an award winning re recording engineer for the past 40 years. He's worked with a wide array of clients for both theatrical film releases and major television documentary series. His clients include Ron Howard, Jim Jarmusch, Ken Burns, and many others. It was interesting because, like, for instance, surrounds were frequency limited. All the low frequency of the surrounds was funneled up to the front. Uh, so the, the technical setup was a little bit unusual, particularly according to today's standards. But it was fun. It was fun to be able to do that and have things all around because the Dolby surround was there, but that was just left, center, right with a mono surround, and it was matrixed, which meant that there wasn't a real hard separation between the channels. So, you know, the left and right would bleed into the surrounds a little, and the center would bleed a little into the left and right, regardless of what you did. And this was great because you had discrete channels and man, you could move stuff around. It was terrific. We learned a lot on that. Mike yeah, we... uh, sat in with us in effects and, and Dan handled the dialogue in ADR. You know, the stuff was, was really sounding terrific. Lots of layers of sound. Then we started the final mix. John Williams did the score. Along with the Chieftains. And need I say more? Yes, I know yeah. the Chieftains, but... You know, music was so grandiose that all the subtle right. effects that we had. <laughs> we, well, we'd have this great mix and the music would start and the effects would That's just it. go away. Well, I remember, I remember uh, Alicia 
pulling the feathers out of the chickens <laughs> in order to get that sound. And he was like really intense on the sound. And I'm saying, I don't know if this is going to play, you know, because it was very subtle. And uh, sure enough, you know, the music uh, just kind of, and even with the land race, the only thing that really stood out were the bangs and crashes. Everything else was just kind of there with the rumble. Yeah. Talk I, about how I you did the punches. Yeah. Oh, the, how you did the punches for the boxing. The punches. Oh, well, we brought in, into a Foley stage, we brought in a professional guy, and we brought in a side of beef and a couple of different types of vegetables, uh, a melon, a Chickens. turkey. Well, a turkey. We brought in a, a fresh turkey. This guy pulverized <laughs> without breaking the skin. Pulverized. Every bone in that turkey was broken. <laughs> <laughs> and we recorded it on multitrack. So for every one punch, we had eight mics going that were being recorded on a multitrack. So we had, you know, different mid-range, low-end, oh, yeah. high-end. So we could mix and match these sounds. They were great. So much so that when NBC put it on television. They literally took all those out. They just had the music. I said, what happened to the punches? They, they were too brutal, they said. They were too brutal. I said, give me a break, brutal. <laughs> and then, believe it or not, after it was all done, we, we set up this, the Foley stage with plastic bags and made sure everything was clean and sterilized. They came in, we, we recorded the stuff, and then we had the soup kitchen come and pick it all up <laughs> and, brought it, and brought it down to the soup kitchen and, and basically <laughs> gave it to the ho you know the homeless. It was it was a win win situation. <laughs> yeah, the other thing I remember about the punches in particular in the fights is I'd mix them and we'd check them against the dialogue and the music and and they'd be dry as toast. So it, they sounded like, you know, it was a microphone. And I had to end up putting up so much reverb on them before they blended into the environment. They sounded like they were in St. Paul's Cathedral. It was like, bang, 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 bang. But you mixed it all together with the music and all the other action and the crowds, and, and they sounded terrific. But if yeah. you heard them on their own, isolated from the rest of it, it'd be like, these, these sound crazy. Yeah, it was a uh, six-track uh, stereo. Yeah, that's right. It was yeah. it was all done on uh, on mag, and then they coated the seventy millimeter film and put the six tracks on that. First of all, we were working with mag elements. elements, so you had a limited amount of playback material because you had a limited amount of machines. Each machine, which was the size of a small closet, would only be able to run six tracks maximum. And that's after being taken down from six mono tracks. And you didn't want to, even with Dolby noise reduction, you wanted to minimize the amount of times you copied because there were hundreds and hundreds of effects tracks. So we'd have to put up a chunk, mix them down, put their mixes against the next chunk, mix that all down together, and so on and so forth. And uh, the land race in particular was crazy because there were just every horse every cart every track everything had its own was track and its own sound and everything was moving all over the place but yeah, they uh, had cameras dug into the ground yeah where the wagons would go right over them yeah Here's an excerpt from the epic land race scene that Dominic and Chick are describing. To get an even deeper insider track on the Foley work that went into the scene, check out the Foley Artist episode from the Sound One era 1968 to 2012 series, detailing the amazing creativity that Foley artist Felicia Birnbaum utilized to create the illusion of racing hundreds of horses and wagons. That sound one when Far and Away was being done, and I didn't work on Far and Away, but I was there when it was going on, so I remember all of the crazy stuff, and I remember, like, it was the most intense Foley job I've ever seen. It was a big crew. I mean, the film was big in terms of the size of the film itself. It was 70 millimeter, you know, it was a big widescreen, huge Western epic 
kind of film. Like, as Chick said, we didn't really get to work on that kind of movie in New York very often. Uh, years before Arthur Penn's movie, Missouri Breaks, was kind of on that scale, but not even that big. Yeah. And uh, I had left Sound One. I had started working at that soundtrack, which at that time was just beginning. Ron had done The Missing with That's Chris correct. Jenkins and Frank Montano had done it there in the room that I'm working in now with Bobby. And I came in right after that. And then the next film that Ron did, I think, was Cinderella Man. I got hired to do it, which was a thrill to me. I was like really, really happy to be getting to be a part of this, this world. That's re-recording mixer Tom Fleischman, whose collaborations with Ron Howard include the films Cinderella Man and Angels and Demons. He's also worked regularly with directors such as Martin Scorsese, Jonathan Demme, Spike Lee, Errol Morris, Robert Benton, Alfonso Cuaron, Brian De Palma, Mike Nichols, Francis Ford Coppola, and George Roy Hill. He received an Oscar for his work on Martin Scorsese's Hugo and has been nominated by the Academy for his work on five additional films. I worked on, I think, three films with you guys, Cinderella Man and Angels and Demons, which we did in Hollywood at this enormous mixing stage at Sony, and then The Dilemma which was back in New York. But one of the things that really impressed me about Ron was the way that he would give me a chance to do my pass and then make subtle changes to it. And he was there a lot. It wasn't like some directors where you couldn't even get him to the stage. Mm -hmm. Cinderella Man, I think he was around a lot. After we had done pre-dubs, once we got into finals, I worked with Bobby on Cinderella Man. I did the music and dialogue, and Bobby did sound effects. There's a lot of punches. <laughs> yeah. I can remember that the crowd effects were a big part of those boxing scenes. I mean, there were the punches, obviously, but the crowd reactions and then the announcers, the ringside announcer was narrating through it. So it was, it was a tricky, and it was a lot of music, too. So it was like these big crowd effects with... A lot of dialogue because the you know there was a lot of dialogue during the fight. The ring announcer was constantly commentating. Uh, yeah, Paul Giamatti also was manager yeah. telling him you know right. kind of coaching the guys him in while the he's corner fighting. Were talking Screaming. and so you had to be able yeah. to hear all this dialogue with this you know huge crowd scene and big score. So it was it was a real challenge. That was a challenge. One of the things that comes to mind is that. Much of the sound that Tommy is referring to was production. And we had a dialogue editor, her name is Bronca Merrick. She did an exceptional job putting together these crowd tracks, keeping in mind that the dialogue was part of it. And she was able to extract those dialogue pieces out and fill it in so the crowds themselves held their own. I, I thought that was quite impressive. A lot, a lot of work went into that. And didn't Ron yeah. record a lot of this crowd on location where he would have uh, an auditorium yes. full of people so he would direct yep. them to give the responses that we would need on the stage? She would have to pick through that to come up with all the uh, the, the, the crowd sounds. Yeah, you know, getting the, the directions out yeah. of the track so it sounds, you know, natural. I'll never forget, even in The Missing, one of the scenes was really very bad, just required a lot of work, but you have to be very careful, especially with all the equipment that we have today where we can notch and we can process. Sometimes that will alter the quality of the voice. Oh, yeah. You clear out the noise, but then you're also messing up with the uh, the, vo the voice, the vocals. And he he can be a good judge to say, no, this is working. I'm, I'm good with that. And we move on. Yeah, I mean, he's always a stickler for dialogue yep. being as, you know, as clear as possible. And he, w and he would prefer the production over a the ADR. He uses the ADR as a as a means in an event the uh, production isn't working, which is tough because uh, when we have those spotting sessions, he does pack on a lot of uh, a lot of ADR lines, and we prepare them. A lot of times, guys like Tommy will take the dialogue and he'll just put a syllable from the ADR oh, yeah, in with yeah. the production and and make it sound really good and you never know. Am yeah. I right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, it was really uh, amazing. And then once again, we brought in professional boxers in the in the Foley stage, and we had several mics set up. We had them on the guys yeah, around you, them. Yeah, you hired so, two boxers from Brooklyn to come yeah. in and just beat each other up for a day. Yep. No. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> These guys, they were just hitting each other in the head, the gut, the get chest. Out. I couldn't get, ever, get over it. It was like, holy and shit. And they would it's... do anything for 100 bucks, yeah. <laughs> whatever it was. It was. <laughs> and, and we had different type of microphones so that we got, you know, low-end hits. We got more high-end hits. And it, it, was, it was really pretty good. As I think what fact, we did is we took that and we spent a day in the studio coming up with all these styles of – of punches like body yeah. glances, body hits, exactly. stomach hits, face, face hits. hits. Yeah. And yeah. then we categorized it so that you can grab and pick one and put it into a specific spot. And while we were mixing, you know, Ron or Mike or Dan would say, Hey, you know, let's swap out that punch for a better body hit or this. And we would just, you would just go and grab it and slide it in place. And, yeah. and then we would, you know, make it louder. <laughs> Editorially, I, I had a fun time on that movie in the boxing scenes because I had to come up with, Ron kept saying, you guys got to come up with something that's different, that makes this thing stand apart. And, and I don't know what you're going to do, but you got to do something. <laughs> so I started playing around in the boxing scenes with different techniques. And I found that on a punch, because they shot all these big close-ups and all different angles of the punches in slow-mo and regular speed. They also had old-time 1935 flash bulbs flashing at ringside from the reporters, and they would create this intense flash that would last for about two or three frames. And I found that if I took some of those frames, which had a little bit of the boxer's image in them, if I froze them for about eight frames, just made a freeze frame, eight or nine frames, right in the middle of this punch, it gave it an impact that gave it some power and... I got so in love with it, I started overdoing it. And Ron, we had to stop doing too much of it. So we found the right amount. And then when you mix that with the sound effects, it really came to life. Yeah, I remember that with the sound of the flash bulbs. Uh -huh. That there were so many of them going on during the scene, but we were careful not to cover every single one, but almost making right. the flashes sound musical and mm -hmm. trying to pick and choose when was a good time to add one and not add one because they were going on throughout the fight, so we didn't just want right. to have uh, flashes going on all the time. So we were very selective of when and, and where. And I think in the yeah. last fight in round, was it 15, round 15? Yeah. With the bear, I mean, that one, yeah. that's a second highlight of my career, yeah. that, <laughs> <laughs> that scene. You know, it was great to do all the boxing stuff, but the memorable part of that film for me was the family the depression and the poverty and the relationship between him and his wife. Renee Zellweger played his wife and they had a couple little kids and electricity was turned off in the middle of winter. It was all these things that happened with the family that it really, really got me, you know, emotionally. It was on an emotional level. So in addition to the, the scope of the boxing and the excitement of that was this storyline that was really, really heartfelt and really tugged at the heartstrings. And that, that was what made it for me. One of the things that I found interesting was when we were doing Parenthood. Parenthood was made up of a whole bunch of different stories that dealt with family. And what I thought was interesting is he, Ron was into previewing his films to kind of get an idea of how people would respond to, to the different films. And he'd have several. And each one that he had, he would put something in, take something out, and see how that response came across with the people. And I thought that was an interesting way of doing it. It was tough because there was a lot of confirmations that we had to contend with, but that was uh, just a, a style that I think he, he became very comfortable with. Well, for a while, we had him fooled a little bit where Dan and I would say, oh, no, you can't make that change now. It's too late. But uh, <laughs> eventually he realized that we were... Uh, Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> he was always really excited about each project, no matter whether it was a bomb later or not. He, I mean, what he really is is a storyteller, and he loves all different kinds of stories. I think that's what accounts for why he'd made so many diverse types of films. I never saw him lose his temper. I never saw him belittle anyone. He was just a... Uh, he's exactly how you would expect Opie or Richie Cunningham to be. <laughs> <laughs>
The sound recording engineer for this episode was Kristen Catonia. Music credits include clips from the soundtracks to Frost Nixon by Hans Zimmer, Far and Away by John Williams and the Chieftains, Cinderella Man by Thomas Newman, and Solo, A Star Wars Story by John Powell. This episode was produced by myself, Isabel Siderny. Stay tuned for the next episode featuring the collaborators of Spike Lee. 